podcast audience. Happy to be speaking with you again today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Rothman. I am a clinically practicing ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist by training, uh, currently working uh, about 50% of the time uh, in a large group practice, private equity backed in New York, OCLI. Um, the remainder of my time I spend managing InFocus Capital Partners, which is an ophthalmology specific venture capital fund. Um, our first fund is closed. We have 12 assets that we are currently navigating through some tumultuous times and are in the process of raising capital for fund two. It is a pleasure for me to be welcoming today's guest who I've had the opportunity to speak to in the past several times um, as the InFocus uh, portfolio um, had some desire to invest in um, the space that this company is in. Um, but as we ran out of money, realized we weren't going to be able to do anything in fund one, but we do actively um, uh, have plans for continuing the diligence process in fund two. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit. But today's guest is uh, Jay Cormier from Idaptic. He is the CEO and founder of the company. And uh, I just mentioned to Jay as we were talking before the podcast that I think we spent a lot of time on Zooms over last five years, but I'm not sure that we actually ever saw each other in person. So I'm kind of looking forward to the next few meetings coming up. But Jay, welcome to the OIS podcast. Well, Rob, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So uh, my pleasure. And again, you know, we've had the opportunity to speak and I'm pretty familiar with with Idaptic and, I, and we'll get into all that. But one of the things that I think is important for the podcast and for the podcast audience is to kind of get to know you a little bit better. And, you know, it's come up on numerous different interviews, how um, collegial and intertwined the ophthalmology community uh, on the investment innovation side is. Um, so we're trying to figure out how you got into that. But um, tell us a little about your background, where you started, you know, where you grew up, school, stuff like that, business experience, and how you ended up as the CEO and founder of this company. Well, I would love to. And again, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to actually be part of this ophthalmology community. My background is not ophthalmology. As you know, it's more on the technology side. And I was very fortunate to work for some of the great tech companies, have some great success with some exits. Uh, I was trying some partial retirement. As it turned out, I was really pretty bad at that. Yeah. Um, but it was around that same time that my grandmother um, you know, had macular degeneration, and I saw what that did to her quality of life. And um, she was perfectly sharp, living on her own. And eventually, it was the AMD that drove her into assisted living. And so that kind of really stuck with me. Um, her mother had that as well. And of course, now my father has AMD, and I'm sure I'm up next. Um, so, you know, I was kind of thinking, I wonder if we can use technology to help with this. And I was playing around with augmented reality in a, a completely different space and started wondering if, you know, if we put two and two together, we could get five. And, uh, so I grabbed, uh, our CTO who we, we had worked together before started fooling around and quickly realized that because neither of us had any kind of eye care background or medical background for that matter, that we really had no clue what we were doing, to put it bluntly. So um, this is where I think, uh, you know, Idaptic really got founded is I went out and tried to find some medical advisors. And this is, uh, you know, where serendipity always and luck often wins the day. I bumped into two great retina specialists. Um, I was at an Octane event um, out here in Orange County, California. And uh, on the uh, podium, along with Roger Steiner, was uh, Dr. Mehta. He's a retina specialist at UCI. And I just approached him and I said, hey, you know, Dr. Mehta, would you be interested in being a medical advisor? And he said, you know, let's talk. Um, at that same meeting, um, I saw John Hovenesian walking by. Now, I didn't know John was an ophthalmologist. I knew him from um, some community activities. And I said, you know, I'm looking for advisors. He said, well, you should meet my partner, Dr. Kim at Harvard Eye. And um, both of the, those doctors, Dr. Mehta and Dr. Kim, were very interested. Uh, they both turned out to have technology backgrounds. Uh, Miffel went to MIT before he went into retina. And Dr. Kim was a, a mechanical engineer at Columbia before he went into retina. So once we kind of got into it, uh, it became pretty clear that not only did we have something, 
but that they were interested in being far more than advisors. And I really think that was the founding of Idaptic when they signed on as co-founders and it was myself, my CTO and our two retina specialists that really kicked off Idaptic in a serious way. So you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a not infrequent coincidence that there is some personal connection to a particular issue in ophthalmology that leads people to go into that, you know, particular vertical. So you have family members from macular degeneration and you're thinking, hey, I kind of got to do something here, you know, to try and help those people and potentially help myself. And, you know, obviously there's two ways to go, right? There's the science side. Can we cure macular degeneration? Mm -hmm. Can we figure out how to, you know, stop the disease or whatnot? Or how can we help people actually have the disease with their lives? And your background obviously pushed you into that, you know, t in direction. And, and it, we kind of, we kind of hear that a bit, mm -hmm. but what were you doing that made you think that you could apply your skills to this particular disease process? Was right. it an observation of limitations of these family members or was it, I mean, what, what kind of spurred you into saying, well, maybe we can figure out a better way to do this. Right. So certainly I, because I didn't have a medical or an FDA type of background, um, naturally my thinking went to the technology side. Now, of course, with any startup, the first thing you do is validate those hypotheses, right? And that's where, again, the two doctors were invaluable to this process because very quickly we could prototype something, but we needed to put it on patients. And I think two, you know, I won't say epiphanies, but two, I think clear indications came up is number one, of course, um, Dr. Meta and Dr. Kim explained to me how big a problem this was with no solution. And I, I don't think originally I realized how big a problem it was in terms of just number of people. To your point, I saw the effect it had on people. I didn't know the magnitude of how many people were afflicted. But we also saw, you know, very quickly with our prototypes, they would bring in their patients to the clinic on the weekend who wanted to try on this technology that were desperate for something. And we put it on them and we could immediately see a benefit. We could see that, you know, we didn't have to go through a long, lengthy process to help these people. And I think the icing on the cake was when I finally did enough research to realize this was an FDA class one exempt device, which means I didn't have to go through a lengthy FDA approval cycle. Yeah. So that's always, that's always the key. So you have a unmet need, a personal connection, technical background, and I've got some really, you know, key opinion type leaders who are experiential in that field and sort of help guide you down the path. Sounds like the perfect formula. Plus you don't have to deal that much with, um, an FDA approval, which makes obviously the process a lot more, um, simplified, but also leads to, I think probably a higher level of scrutiny, right? I think you probably find that to some degree as well, yeah. that the FDA clinical trials process is a pain in the neck. But it often does validate things when you don't have to go through that process. People kind of want a little bit more right. um, proof that what you're what you're purporting works actually works. Yeah, yeah. and you know be, because of that, and you know obviously for our own edification, we said yes, maybe we don't need to go through the clinical trial process for FDA, but we did run clinical studies anyways. We felt you know obviously with the doctors and the technical backgrounds that that data would be invaluable. So uh, so. We did run a, an original clinical study with uh, our AMD population uh, with two main endpoints, one being, of course, improvements in visual acuity, but the other one we really tried to quantify, how does this help people with their independent tasks of daily living? So we actually did time task trials, and of course, you know, we compared idaptic versus the person's it, with their regular glasses, and we saw a five times uh, improvement in their ability to do tasks. So that data was incredibly helpful, not only to your point, convincing others that we do indeed have efficacy, but I think it was also important to convince ourselves that we were on the right track. Yeah. So let's, so I want to get back to that at some point um, in, a, in maybe a few minutes, but why don't you spend a little time just explaining to the audience exactly what Adaptics technology is, how it works. Right. So um, I'm going to kind of describe this in sort of two basic chunks, if you will. Um Originally, where we started this company, it was all about vision enhancement. And so fundamentally, from an electronics and technology side, we're taking in the real-world image through the camera and the smart glasses. 
Um, we then process and enhance that image and redisplay it on the high resolution displays that sit in front of your eyes. So you wear this device very much like a pair of glasses, but it is electronics and that has an autofocus camera and the displays in the head mounted uh, glasses. And these are only three ounces, so they are very much like a pair of glasses. Um, but where we focused on and what we felt was really important is because, as you know, the retina is like a, a thumbprint. Every retina is different, which means the way macular de degeneration progresses is different. We felt we really needed an adaptable and customizable solution. And what that said to me as a, a technologist is if you need something that's going to adapt to the user and grow with them over time, then you better be focused on the software. So we always looked at it and said, you know, we are a software company enabled by hardware as opposed to a hardware. So how does, so tell me what happens. Give me the patient experience. Yeah. So, so the pay, and this, this comes back to how does the patient um, actually get the visual improvement or the vision enhancement? And we felt the other part was to keep it very simple, not only from a user interface and user experience standpoint, but that if there was training involved, that that would be very difficult for the user's buying process. So we always focused on, and again, this is where bringing uh, patients into the clinic from the very beginning was critical, always keeping it not only helpful, but um, simple. And so what we've always done is measure how much improvement we get from the vision side of things. And with our early products, we were seeing a three to four line improvement on the eye chart. Okay, so they put these on, um, they apply our enhancement, anything from magnification, contrast, and the way we apply those to the user. And they were immediately doubling their visual acuity. Uh, what we see now on our product today, which is in the market, we've had hundreds of units deployed, is we're regularly seeing um, an average of more than six lines gained on the eye chart. Okay, so patients... We'll put on these glasses. Now, for, just for the audience, I mean, I'm sure most people understand the nature of these diseases, but let's talk specifically about macular degeneration, which I think is your biggest target for this technology, are people who have central visual loss. And right. depending on the degree of magnification, you know, it can be central visual loss, the size of your thumb held at arm's length, or it could be the size of your thumb held two inches from your eye. Mm -hmm. And those obviously have a significantly greater impact on the amount of vision that you can perceive. Your glasses will pick up an image and somehow use your proprietary software to enhance mm -hmm. or do whatever it does to try and make patients see better, right? It's not going to replace central vision, right. I believe, correct? That's, that's but correct. It'll, it'll, it'll enhance and um, allow patients to have a better perception of what of the areas of the eye that do see. Is that correct? Right. And of course, as you know, with macular degeneration or other central vision loss, you always do have peripheral vision that remains, right? And that's what we're really optimizing. And Unless you have glaucoma, which is, you know, my, my Well, we just saw a patient uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she had both macular degeneration and glaucoma. And that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a tough one, right? And so that'll come down, you know, later in the podcast when we talk about our newest AI technology. But for now, focusing on the vision enhancement, um, that's why we focused on those central vision losses, because we knew we had peripheral vision to work with. And as you know, the, you know, the photoreceptors are not as dense in the periphery. The ganglion cells aren't as dense going from the periphery. But you can do things to enhance those and simulate that central vision. But you're right. It's not a cure. It does not replace central vision. Correct. So, so, it, but it does, but does provide some enhancement. And just for clarification, you know, there's a big difference between virtual reality, and augmented reality. Where does this fit into that sort of landscape? Right. No, great, great question. And this is another thing we felt very strongly about from the beginning is that it needed to be augmented reality and it needed to be in a form factor of lightweight glasses. And for two reasons, number one, um, with the VR devices, when you put that on someone's head, not only is it big and bulky, which of course people don't want to wear, but you immediately isolate the patient. And because of that, you know, you've taken away essentially their usable peripheral vision in the real world. And we felt it's very important to integrate with the real world. That's what these users want. They're not gamers. They're not playing VR games. They want to integrate to the real world. So the ability 
for our augmented reality, and we use something called hybrid see-through to kind of do that mixture, um, also allows them their full peripheral vision, so it doesn't inhibit their mobility. Right, and I think that that's critical personally. I think from the perspective of the clinician, um, I think it's for mobility, I think augmented reality is key. I think people need to feel connected to the world in which they're navigating and, and ambulating through. And an assisted device is, is going to be difficult um, when you isolate, like you said, somebody's natural visual capabilities, putting right. them inside of a you know, gamer headset or something that's completely virtual um, right. is probably and, not useful outside the house. Exactly. And, and you know, we find some of these people, they're going to their grandkids' soccer games. Um, they're going shopping with these. Because I think the other thing that we felt strongly about but still may have underestimated is although these people have vision loss they still don't want to stick out and so they want to be wearing a regular pair of glasses correct, correct. people don't want to look like they're completely devious so how does your technology work is it just a battery camera is it attached to a phone does it connect to your smartphone yeah Maybe a little bit more so, details for the world so they understand yeah absolutely so our current product on the that's been on the market for almost two years now is the i5 this is what we call a tethered device. Uh, so to keep those glasses super lightweight um, at only three ounces, all the battery, the processing, obviously the software as well, goes into that companion remote control, which is really a cell phone, right? So it's also can be a connected device, which again is going to be important for the AI side of things. So because you are essentially, uh, let me call it pumping 2 million pixels of real-time video, um, to those glasses, camera in, displays out. That is through a wired tether. And we have tried wireless devices, um, and those have been some of our past products. And although everyone loves the idea of wireless, it forces the battery back into the headset. It makes it heavier. And all of our patients really are not happy with that trade-off. So that's why the i5 has become so popular. So they basically have this thing. It just has a little cord that comes out of it. They run it wherever through their shirt, wherever they want to do about down to their phone. Exactly. Well, and the other thing we've done with that phone is we put the user interface right on the face of the phone. Right. Does, does the phone power the glasses or they have their own? It, it does. So it, it everything, the, even the battery is in the phone. So we'll get three hours of battery life out of that phone powering the glasses. Okay. So, so patients need a cell phone. They need the glasses. And then... Um, and actually, the cell phone comes with it, I should say. We we bundle that as a package. Yeah, the cell phone is not their own cell phone. It's a right. power pack that has computing capability and and, and, and whatnot. Correct. Right. Um, okay. And so, so, you know, here's always the concern, right? The concern is that you create this and you tell people they're going to be able to see better. Um, somebody tells them to buy it, but how do they know it's going to work for them? You right. actually have data. Tell us yeah. a little bit more about the data, because I think that that's kind of a differentiator here, because as you've said, the lack of it, uh, a formal FDA pathway for some of this leads to some, you know, well, I don't want to use a derogatory term, but it can be kind of uh, fabricated claims, right? Absolutely. And get people to say, hey, these things work great, buy these. Right. And, you know, there's a million companies out there with tech, you know, promoting um, we can cure colorblindness, we can cure this, we can cure mm -hmm. that with your glasses. And they don't need any data to support that. And they kind of like the vitamin world where you can kind of right. just say what you want to say. Exactly. You guys actually have data. So yeah. can you describe a little bit about how these studies were done and what it showed? Because I think that that's critical for people to understand why your technology has a pretty good chance of being, right. you know, commercially successful now. Exactly. And, and again, that's why we felt it was important to do that, those clinical studies. The first one, like I mentioned, was on macular degeneration. We did a sample size of 20. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had enough of a sample size to prove the statistics. But again, very aware that we didn't have to do a huge sample size out of the gate and spend a lot of money on that. Um, so at an end of 20, these statistics were pretty overwhelming on how much visual acuity improvement and impact on daily living we were getting. So um, we did put that paper together that was presented by Dr. Mehta at um, CSUN, which is an assisted technology conference. Um, what we did uh, about a year and a half ago is extend that to the next disease state, which is diabetic retinopathy. Again, we know that's another central vision loss. We felt it was important 
to again establish that efficacy. Um, and so uh, we ran a diabetic retinopathy study with two main endpoints. Again, the first one being, of course, improvements in visual acuity, where we saw another doubling of visual acuity. Um, but we also, um, on that one, looked at contrast sensitivity improvement. And that's where we saw a 50% improvement in contrast sensitivity for these users. Um, so that was presented at the Retina Society of America last fall. So, you know, the fact that we not only did, you know, clinical studies, but also had peer reviews and accepted papers and presentations, I think says a lot uh, on the medical team's uh, capabilities at IDAPT, which again, I think sets us apart. But now here's the second part of the data. Nothing's as, a val as valuable as a huge sample size, right? And so what we do is um, we made a decision early on. It became very clear that selling direct to consumer to visually impaired people is very difficult. Although intellectually attractive, we don't want to sell a unit unless someone's seen a demo, right? So that's when we made the decision to sell through the eye care channel. And so we have literally hundreds of data points where we know what the person's visual acuity is before idaptic and after idaptic. Um, and that's why we know from countless demo days at these practices that we're regularly seeing for people in the target, which we target 2070 to 2400 best corrected visual acuity, that we're seeing six plus lines of vision. And that's not over a sample of 20, that's over a sample of hundreds. And that also leads to immediately to who's buying. Right. So that's the question, right? So the question is, there's, you can't turn on the television today without seeing an advertisement for a pharmaceutical company that has a drug to treat macular degeneration, right? We've got ads for wet macular degeneration. We've got ads for dry macular degeneration. Right. And, you know, there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people out there with significant visual disability from these diseases. And those companies are finding the wherewithal to go out and make these mass marketing campaigns because somehow, and I don't know how it works, they think that their patient's going to go into their retina specialist and say, I would like this particular drug. Right. <laughs> we know that's not really how it works, but I guess it puts the concept into people's minds that there's treatment out there for them. Yep. This technology, in my opinion, is equally, if not more important. Right, because here you have the people who are actually suffering those diseases, who may get stability from these treatments. So certainly not going to get better from any of the treatments out there, right? We know that they may gain stability and may not get significantly worse. But there's a lot of people out there with severe visual disability from these conditions, and yet there's no TV ads. Right? Why are there no TV ads for idaptic? Why has not the market? adapted to the fact that we also have a significant opportunity here, not just for patient improvement, mm -hmm. right? Of making patients' lives better, because this actually could really help them, right. but in terms of an economic opportunity, right. why is it taking so long or why is it not mobilizing into the true business opportunity right. that it really is? Well, so I would, I would say, there? no, it, that's, that's a great question. And I would say there's a two-part answer to that. Um, and when I look at this, I look at it from A, the marketing side, but also B, the channel side, right? And from the marketing side, what we realized early on, and we've done this over the years, is we could advertise through what I would call very standard digital marketing, whether it's Facebook or Google ads, and at rather modest um, prices uh, or cost per lead, we could we could and did fill up our database with people interested. So from a fiscal standpoint, there's no reason to spend millions on ads when I can spend a fraction of that and still fill up my database with qualified leads, people that have macular degeneration and want our glasses. Right. So that's the marketing side. When I think of it from the channel side, because we don't sell direct to consumer, we feel it's very important that they have a demo before they buy. And we're seeing 50% conversion rate when this happens with correct targeting. So what we're really doing to before we spend more money on marketing, which we found very successful, is to make sure our channel is in place. And that comes back to more practices having idaptic in their practice. 
Right. So how does it work? So tell me how you sell through the ophthalmology channels, because, right. you know, as a glaucoma, I mean, I, I, I think that probably your retina general optometric world is probably a lot more adept at this. My particular practice may or may not be. We'll talk about that in a minute. But how does it work? How does the yeah. process work? So, the commercialization. So in side. general, we sell either through ophthalmologists, retina specialists, or yeah. optometrists, right? It really depends on A, does the practice have the right patient flow? And B, do they have obviously the desire, especially on the retail side, to do this? And uh, we're finding great success with all of those different doctors, um, but it's a pretty simple process. Um, once uh, a practice is interested, the entire financial commitment is the price of a demo unit. Um, what we then will do is we'll train their staff, whether that's an optician or an ophthalmic tech. Uh, of course, we don't want the doctors doing anything other than saying, you're a good target for idaptic, right? Um, we'll go in, we'll train their staff, and then we'll help them set up a demo day. And a demo day is simply you bring in four to 10 patients, but at least four in the target. We'll bring out our clinical engineer. We just did a couple demo days last week, actually. And we will demo right there on the spot. And what happens time in and time out is we're converting it around that 50% for patients in the target. So it's great for the practice because they get lots of hands-on training. They immediately pay back their demo unit and then they're off to the races. And we'll go back and do multiple demo days if a practice needs that. Um, we do are just onboarding some sales reps to go back and reinforce those practices inside uh, the eye care practice. And um, we find that that's very successful and leads to repeated conversion, which of course is both great for the patients, great for the practice, and great, great for idaptic. And And the cost of the unit um, which I, you don't need to disclose on the podcast here, but um, A, is there any insurance reimbursement towards this? And B, the practices that sell it obviously get some margin on this yes. to make it financially viable to them. A absolutely. So, the, you know, the practices are making, you know, 30 to kind of 50% margin, depending on where they price it. Um, reimbursement is still the tricky part with this because much like hearing aids, uh, Medicare does not reimburse. Right. So there's some narrow channels that reimburse, like the Veteran Affairs, some of the state agencies. A VSP actually does have some plans that cover partial reimbursement. So we've seen that as well. But for the most part, just like a hearing aid, it tends to be paid out of pocket. Right. And, and you know, and again, and, and coming from a, a glaucoma practice where I deal with, you know, complicated and, you know, tertiary referral glaucoma. We see, you know, it's a it's a daily complaint from multiple patients about difficulties with ambulation. So, right. you know, getting around and can't doing things, and you know, I, our general response has been to try and send them to some low vision specialist to try and get some sort of guidance. But you know, what happens after that is kind of a black hole to us, and we don't really know what happens. And a lot of times, you'll hear these stories of people coming back and spending thousands of dollars on glasses, but having no real benefit. Right. And and you know whether they've been exposed. You know, I I don't think they've been exposed to to this technology yet, but. Um, you know, kind of seems like maybe that's something that needs to be a little bit more widely dispersed out into the community. And I would assume that you have grander plans for the broader commercialization of your product. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly where we are today with Idaptic. Now that we've proved efficacy, we've proved conversion, we know how to work with a practice to make them successful and, and you know, benefit their patients, of course, that now it's time to commercialize, expand our channel and just be able to bring on a whole lot more practices so we can reach, to your point, those millions of people that need to help. And that right. want so to help. From, a, from an investor perspective, at this point, this is a pure commercialization you know, time for you. It's really all about scaling up, growing your business, and getting it in the hands of more people who can distribute it to more and more patients. Yeah, w without a doubt, that is the prime objective right now. I think as a technology company, and of course, you know, again, my background as a technologist, one of the benefits we also have that I certainly play to is knowing that because I don't have to go through a lengthy uh, approval process, I can outmaneuver people on the technology side. And so although our primary objective now is that commercialization channel, that doesn't mean we're asleep on the technology side. Right. 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 So that's why we just recently launched our uh, AI visual assistant 
Right. That's um, what I was about to ask you about, too. Exactly. And this, you know, to your point about glaucoma patients, what's always been in the back of our mind is, okay, we know macular degeneration is a huge unmet need, but what about these people that have something else, whether it's glaucoma, RP, uh, how can we help them? Or when someone has macular degeneration, as you pointed out earlier, and gets worse and worse, how can they extend their visual journey? And this is where our new generative AI visual assistant comes in. And some of what, and that's been in beta testing for six months before we launched uh, in August. And what some of these patients have done uh, absolutely blew our mind. We knew it would be powerful, uh, but basically a multimodal generative AI agent that can observe your surroundings, take a picture, and all you do to interact with it is talk to it, makes the by far the easiest and most comprehensive user interface. So can you explain a little bit of how that works? I watched the demo um, of that. It was pretty impressive. Um, and I think for people with severe visual loss, it may be game-changing. So can you just tell the audience how that kind of works? Sure. So from a, from a user interface standpoint, it couldn't be easier. You snap a picture, and then we call our visual assistant Ivy. You know, Ivy, what am I looking at? And because this is generative AI, because it is open-ended and very broad, you can ask it anything, and Ivy will then describe what you're looking at. She'll read for you. She'll summarize a paragraph for you. Um, she can read a recipe for you. She can do pretty much anything you ask her. Uh, we just tell you, again, you know, it's not going to drive for you. Um, but this really extends that targeting of the patients and their visual journey, but it puts iDaptic in a very unique position of the only company with both vision enhancement and the visual assistant. So for example, just for the audience, if you're at a store and you pick up something, you could say, Ivy, what is this that I'm holding? And then when you go to pay, you could say, Ivy, what money is in my hand, right? You can't tell the difference between a $5 bill, a $10 bill, a $100 bill, unless somebody tells you when you have severe yeah. visual loss, you could say, how much money am I holding and how much, you know, things like that, that people take for granted in the real world that people with severe visual disability don't know how to navigate. Well, it's very easy to use a credit card. Uh, you know, you don't even know what the receipt says, right? You know, exactly. you know and people with, you know, there are a lot of very independent, very mobile people with severe visual disability. And right. you don't have and to walk too far in any major city to see somebody, you know, walking with a cane or a dog or something like that. And these people, while it may help them get to place A to help place from A to B, it doesn't really help them when they get where they're going. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, we've, we've seen them do things, and you've probably seen it in some of our videos, where this particularly is an RP user. Uh, he lost his Bluetooth headphones. And... He has very constricted field view, right? And on top of it, the field that's left is about 2350. So very low visual acuity. It could have taken him hours to find those. He simply snapped a picture and said, Ivy's, where, where's my Bluetooth headphones? She thought for a couple seconds and goes in front of you as a couch. To the right of the couch is a table. On the table is your Bluetooth headphones. I mean, it's fascinating. I, I, I watched the demo. It's pretty unbelievable. I think for anybody who's interested in um, learning a little bit about how some of this generative AI can help the visually impaired, you should go to iDaptic's website and and take a look at some of the displays and and, and some of the videos of of, of how Ivy works. Um, you know, uh, I think and you know, we've done I've done other podcasts with companies that are looking into trying to figure out how to provide assistance to people with poor vision. In my opinion, it's one of the least well-served parts of um, the off, you know, the disability spectrum, right? We have um, services for the blind, we have guilds for the blind, and they'll mostly provide um, social emotional support. Right. But in terms of pure functionality, um, I think that um, despite you know a few exceptions out there of some really exceptional services like Helen Keller Services for the Blind and a few others that exist, there really isn't any ability for them to provide any true ambulation assistance. And it's very right. difficult um, for patient and it's very different experience for them to have somebody come to their house to help them do something than it is for them to be independent, even just moving around their own in environment. So I think there's a real opportunity for what you built here to provide uh, maybe the first of what I hope are other key developments in the space to help people with visual disability um, you know, get around. Unfortunately, we haven't figured out how to cure a lot of stuff that yet. You know, I think that's one of the missions of InFocus as a venture fund is to try and 
um, help um, you know find those cures, prevent some of this, but it's not going to help all the people and um, you know that already have visual disability and need and need help. And the population is unfortunately growing. Yes, a- absolutely. And again, we're always thinking of you know new ways we can help those people. Um, certainly, we've always felt that AI not just generative AI, but AI in general is critical because how do you make something more powerful without making it more complex? Right. And I think that's very critical for this user base. And AI offers that path where you can tap into massive amounts of whether it be, you know, data or training models or, you know, just your own personal experience for um, customizing it without making that a more difficult process for the user is everything, I think. You mean AI has some other purpose besides creating fake photos of our presidential candidates? Exactly. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I think this is, of course, you know, we're biased sitting here on this podcast, but I think this is one of the great uses of multimodal generative AI, but yeah. we're still just scratching the surface. Yeah, no, I agree. No, look, I mean, uh, you know, unfortunately we're running out of time here, but, um, um, you're going to have the opportunity, I know, in the near future to present some of your newest information to scientific audience, correct? You're going to be at some meetings, is that? Yeah, I think uh, we've got OIS uh, coming up in San Diego, and I think that's November, right? So uh... that is the, yes, in November, the OIS meeting in San Diego, which is, you know, in my opinion, one of the um, greatest forms for the display of innovation and ophthalmology. So I'm glad you will be there. And, um, you know, I think it's good for the innovation community and the investment community that come together at these meetings to hear about some of the opportunity here, you know, and I, and I think that there is a, a real need to continue to fund companies like yours, to, you know, because this is really um, something that's going to help people in real time in the real world. And we have a, a tendency, you know, even on the venture investment side, you know, to my own discredit of looking for those, um, you know, home run cure type opportunities, when in reality, um, we can help a lot of people right now, right? By, you know, by giving them access to, to you know, technology like yeah, yours. Exactly. And, you know, I think we've de-risked a lot of that because we are in the market now and we see that in practices. So uh, certainly, you know, we're very happy where we are. We're very happy with how we're helping these people. And we're very excited about the latest technology to help them even more. Yeah. Well, Jay, listen, I, I, I thank you so much for your time today. I do appreciate um, the effort um, and the motivation that you have to address this issue. It's unfortunate, and I apologize that you have to live it firsthand through your own family. Um, and I know the concerns about your own health play into your decision making, but there are millions of people out there who will benefit from this technology. And I hope that you continue to find success um, in growing your business and in getting this product out to the world. So, um, Thanks for taking the time. I'm sure we're going to need some updates from you down the road as you continue to grow into a much bigger um, company. Um, We'll be certainly looking forward to seeing those developments and we'll be happy to repeat this podcast um, at a later point when we have, um, you know, some really good news about future product and growth from from your side. Well, thanks very much for having me, Rob. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you at OIS in San Diego. Uh, For the OIS listening audience, thank you again for taking the time. Um, on behalf of myself and Jay Cormier from Idaptic. Um, thanks again. Looking forward to speaking with you again in the future.